Gary Rocco, manager of the Advanced Nuclear Concepts Group at Sandia National Laboratories. I'd like to welcome you to the Nuclear Energy Systems Laboratory, Brayton Lab, where we're going to give you a video tour of our recompression closed Brayton cycle. To give that tour, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Jim Posh, who will guide you through our test article. Hello, I'm Jim Posh. I'm the principal investigator for the supercritical carbon dioxide closed Brayton cycle research and development program going on here at Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of how we got to where we are today, going back to 1939 when the first closed Brayton cycle system was developed in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, all the way up to where we are today. Behind me is our test assembly with the components that we use to test this technology. I'm going to be explaining uh, each of these components uh, in a little bit. Right now, let me tell you about the history. As I said, it goes back to 1939 with air as the working fluid in closed Brayton cycles that were first developed by the Escher Weiss Company in Zurich, Switzerland. Between the 1930s and 1970s, a total of about 24 of these systems were uh, manufactured and installed worldwide. The primary working fluid was air. The uh, operating performance uh, efficiency got up to about 30%, and I'll explain in a little bit why supercritical carbon dioxide is a better working fluid. But 30% is what they worked with that was competitive back then. These cycles were developed not only for electrical power, but also as cogeneration systems to heat factories. Helium was also used as a working fluid, but the primary working fluid was air. Then in the 1960s, uh, a, an Italian investigator named uh, Professor Angelino started to do research in closed brake cycles to figure out how they could be made better, particularly what working fluid would be better than air to provide higher efficiency. He looked at uh, many dozens of different working fluids and came to the conclusion that carbon dioxide was the, uh, would be an excellent working fluid. And that's primarily because of its critical temperature, which is 88 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that uh, with, in a typical uh, atmospheric environment, we can reject heat and get the working fluid down to nearest critical point where its compressibility is much less. At that point, we can compress it and then heat it and expand it through a turbine. And in this way, reduce the amount of work that's required relative to an air system. Not only did Angelino investigate the optimal working fluid for the closed braking cycle, he also investigated various configurations for the closed braking cycle. From that work, he concluded that the recompression configuration would be optimal for a particular power source, such as a nuclear reactor. A recompression cycle requires two compressors in order to, uh, to process the working fluid and, and increase the efficiency. You can get a 5 to 8% uh, efficiency increase with a recompression cycle compared with a simple closed braking cycle. Now, how does that compare with our common steam cycles? Depending on your assumptions, you can re realize improvements in performance of anywhere from 5 to 10 per percentage points, which is huge. If that were implemented throughout the, all of the uh, power production facilities in the U.S., we would be saving tens of billions of dollars a year. Now, since the 1960s, recognizing that the recompression cycle is most efficient, uh, what has been done, NASA has been particularly interested in the closed rate cycle for power production on, uh, on the moon, on Mars, and also on spaceships. Uh, the working fluid in those situations is different than the carbon dioxide. But from the work that was done here at Sandia in the 1990s, particularly by Steve Wright, it was recognized uh, that there was potential to generate power, particularly in nuclear reactors, here on Earth. And it was in the early 2000s that Steve Wright started to analyze the uh, potential performance of a recompression cycle using supercritical carbon dioxide. In 2006, Sandia started to invest money in this technology on the order of $1.5 million to demonstrate the viability of it. From the positive results achieved in, in those experiments, DOE, ENI, Office of Nuclear Energy, P 
picked up the ball and started to invest in this technology in the recompression cycle. Since that time, uh, the Office of Nuclear Energy has invested on something on the order of $13 million to develop this technology. What we have now is a working recompression cycle, the purpose of which is to demonstrate uh, the performance of this cycle at uh, engineering scale conditions. And that means we're not operating at the optimal uh, high pressure, we're not operating at the optimal high temperature. What we are doing is investigating this science at a scaled down engineering uh, uh, scale system to demonstrate that it works. So what have we achieved with our recompression cycle so far? Our design temperature is 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We've achieved 930 degrees Fahrenheit. Our design pressure ratio is 1.8. We've achieved 1.45. And our speeds on our turbo alternator compressors, which we'll see soon, is uh, designed for 75,000 RPM, and we have been in the mid-50s. So we have a little ways to go to achieve uh, the, the optimal uh, power out of this system to understand the, the efficiency to, and to uh, demonstrate the uh, viability of the recompression configuration. We are working to achieve those goals here in FY14. Now, let me show you the heart of our system. This is the heart of our machine, the turbo alternator compressor. Let me tell you a little bit more about our turbo alternator compressors, the heart of this uh, assembly. This is one of them, we have two. In a recompression cycle, you're gonna have uh, two compressors. At this end is the compressor. This is a, a centrifugal compressor. Uh, the fluid comes in actually like this and gets slung around at high speeds and pressurized and comes out here. When we pressurize, when we compress this fluid, we are doing it at a state of the fluid in which its uh, compressibility is actually relatively small compared to air. And this is why carbon dioxide, super critical carbon dioxide, is a better working fluid than air was dating back to 1939 and throughout the 20th century. Because you can get this, the carbon dioxide to a, uh, a thermodynamic state where it takes less energy to pressurize it. It takes more energy than, uh, than water, but less than air. So we gain some efficiency there. Over here is the turbine. Uh, again, this is a radial turbine. The fluid comes in, it's, it's been heated up, it's very hot, still high pressure. And it comes in here and it spins around the radial turbine uh, in there. And that's what, what drives this whole uh, machine. So we, we have our turbine here on, on the same shaft that we have the compressor, the turbine drives the compressor. In between here is where our uh, generator is. So we, uh, each of these are designed, this one and the other uh, tap are designed to generate 125 kilowatts of electricity. If the tap is the heart of the recompression cycle, then these are the lungs. These are the recuperators. We have a low temperature recuperator, and a high temperature recuperator. This is where we recuperate or regain, capture most of the heat energy that remains in the low pressure working fluid after it uh, leaves the uh, turbines. There's a great deal of heat energy that remains in there, even though it's low pressure, and if we were to simply throw that away in, uh, uh, to the environment, that would be an incredible waste. As a matter of fact, in a uh, typical recompression cycle, up to 80% of the heating that occurs of the fluid after it gets compressed and before it goes into the turbines comes from recuperation. That means only 20% of, uh, of the temperature gain comes from an external heat source, whether that be a nuclear reactor, coal, natural gas, the sun. One characteristic about these heat exchangers is that right now the only supplier is an English company. We need to make this recompression cycle American-made. We've identified companies within the U.S. Who, are, who want to work with us to develop these heat exchangers, and these are extremely efficient. This is designed to transmit 1.7 uh, megawatts of heat, and this 2.3 megawatts of heat. If this were a typical shell and tube heat exchanger, it would be much, much larger. So these are very compact, very efficient, 
but they are also expensive because there's only one manufacturer in the world. And we are working to uh, change that, to make that American-made. It is our objective to make this whole cycle American-made. Closed Brayton cycles can be used for almost any heat source. The hotter the better, but any heat source. There are people out there now looking to use waste heat, lower temperature heat, to generate electricity. We are looking to apply a recompression cycle which is ideally suited for higher temperature heat sources. That could still be a waste heat source, such as from a uh, gas turbine, but our customer, NE, uh, is looking to apply this for uh, a nuclear reactor. With the, uh, our simulated heat source that we have, uh, we have uh, six immersion heaters, we can simulate any heat source. We have already demonstrated that we can simulate uh, concentrated solar power heat source. We simulated the passing of clouds uh, in front of the sun. We anticipate that we will be demonstrating various transients that occur with the nuclear reactor. Sandia National Labs has the infrastructure to test and verify the performance of a recompression closed Brayton cycle. That is what we intend to do in the near future. The purpose of this testing will be to inform the design of a demonstration plant, which we anticipate working on to, uh, to develop in the next few years. Thank you.